Hey folks, thanks for joining us for this session. We're really uh, excited to see you all here and excited for the discussion today. Um, I'm Sean Stewart. My background is the least important of all of here today. I'm, my goal as a moderator is to help make sure we stay on time, uh, make sure there's no fights between panelists, so let me know if you see anything breaking out, uh, and really just make sure we cover a range of topics you're excited to talk about here today. We've, we've convened here to talk about accessibility and mobility, which is a pretty large topic covering a range of different challenges uh, and solutions and technologies and policies that can make it easier for every member of society, uh, both in the US and around the world, to access the same mobility solutions that are available with the similar access. Um, what we've never experienced as a group is uh, a human mobility landscape where everybody has the same access to the same solutions. Uh, and that's really what we're passionate about and here to talk about today. As a starting point to get us into the mindset, think about how you got here if you're not from Austin. I came in here yesterday from Brooklyn. Think about every train, plane, shuttle bus, scooter, taxi, Uber you got into, all the different steps you had to take, escalators, elevators, just finding my badge at the registration here at South By and coordinating through all of the different landscapes and sessions we've had over the past couple days. Now imagine going through those same steps with any number of permanent disabilities that members of our society deal with. Without your vision, without your hearing, uh, being in a wheelchair, any of those factors, and now consider all the things you had to do to get here and how challenging they may have been or what solutions may, be, may have been needed to make that experience a more positive one. And that's really the session and the debate we're excited to have today. My hometown in New York, I live in Brooklyn, just announced a $5.2 billion budget to make 95% of the MTA subway stations accessible for all use cases by 2055. Now, three of those things stand out to me. One, $5 billion is necessary to go back and improve what should have been improved and available in the first place, but now has to be retrofitted into infrastructure that was designed and developed many years ago. In addition to that, you have a 95% goal from $5 billion, which is they can't even satisfy 100% of use cases through that type of funding. And then the final piece is it's gonna take more than 30 years from where we are today to get to those solutions, where many of the people who need them today actually won't be around to experience them. These are the type of things we wanna debate. How can we be better at planning what infrastructure mobility solutions are being deployed today so that 20 and 30 years from now, we're not going back to fix the errors of not understanding the different use cases, the different community members, and the different use, uh, uses overall of those mobility solutions. So thanks for joining and, and to talk about this important topic. I'm gonna to take a seat now and I'm gonna hand it over to our panelists who are gonna introduce themselves. They'll give you a bit of their background about why they're here. And I think you'll see we brought together some great folks with expertise in this field together. Kevin, do you wanna start? Thank you so much, John. That was an amazing amount of information and I am just so happy to have you here moderating the talk. So my name is Kevin Yu. I am the CEO and founder of Haptic and we are creating the universal language through touch. And I'll explain a bit more about what that means throughout the talk, but it's kind of like a tap that you get on your shoulder in every single country, maybe perhaps with traveling, and or like the first time you've like burned your hand on a stove. These kind of responses are relatively the same across the board, and we are creating that situation with technology and creating universal languages and tools that can help everybody in the world. So thank you so much for being here. Do you want to share the video? And yes, and can we please play that first video that uh, was mentioned? On November 5th, 2017, Simon got to make history as the first blind person to run a New York City marathon unassisted. It's amazing being able to feel where you're going. Puede cambiarnos la vida. Haptics is touch, and touch is the future of digital communications. So Haptic Nav is a navigation device and an app that guides you entirely through touch. 
And what you saw before was the first ever blind runner competing in the New York City Marathon without any assistance. And that made history in 2017. And from there, we've been expanding out into helping communities with blind and visually impaired all over the world, but also partnering with big companies to make sure that we get the exposure so that everybody can feel their way. So, thank you. Amazing. Thanks for joining us here today, Kevin. And next on Kevin's left is, is Joseph, or we call him Joey by now, that we've become friends. But Joey, would you like to give everyone an introduction of how you ended up founding Polaris Technology Group and what your focus is overall? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as Sean mentioned, I'm the founder of Polaris Technology Group um, out of Orlando, Florida. And we tell people we like to work at the crossroads between technology and accessibility. Um, as a member of the uh, blind and visually impaired community, I can see, speak firsthand to the fact that technology really has this potential to give uncomparable amounts of independence to people with disabilities, you know, if done right. So um, Polaris Technology Group was founded to really solve the problem of indoor navigation. We uh, are trying to you know, increase accessibility and just sheer volume of access to maps for buildings. So a venue like this would be able to have a blind or visually impaired person fully navigate um, from their hotel to the exhibit hall in the convention center back up here to Salon Room G fully independently and you know, just as free and easy as an able-bodied person. So that's kind of what we look to do and then just ensuring that technology is made to meet the needs of the people in the community that, you know, that struggle, so. Amazing, thanks for joining us, Joey. And last but not least on the far left, we have Brianna who's joining us from Uber today, who leads up accessibility uh, and community engagement at, at Uber. Um, would you like to take a moment to introduce yourself, Brianna? Oh, I think we have a mic issue here. There we go. Hi. How are you? <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm Brianna Gilmore. I lead accessibility policy at Uber. Um, I've been there for about 18 months. Definitely a weird career shift for me. So my background's in natural resource security and urban planning. And then for the 10 years prior to Uber, I worked um, as a kind of a lived experience disability advocate in a lot of nonprofits and uh, doing a lot of community organizing work and was mystified um, a couple years ago when I saw Uber post at that time what I thought was my dream job. They were looking for an urban planner who had a disability who was used to working with community groups. And so I was like, okay, let's see if they actually want somebody like me. And I showed up and started talking about my work in unhoused communities and in decarceration and the importance of lived experience product design. And they were like, yes, this is what we want. And so um, now I work with these incredible teams of yeah, product designers um, who have all types of lived experience who are really focused on equity and fairness. And I never could have imagined it at a place like Uber. So really excited to be here and meet you all. Amazing. Thanks for joining us today. So maybe, Brianna, you can start us off. Like, let's start at the 50,000-foot view. Where are we today in 2024 when it comes to the planning of mobility <laughs> solutions and the consideration of different disabilities and challenges that might occur with those? What do you think we should be proud of that's working well, that you've seen improvement over your time in this area? And where do you think the most amount of focus needs to be on improving things moving forward? Yeah, that's... I, I could talk for the next couple hours about that. So I thought that I'd just maybe start with a few things that are, have been really on my mind. So I work for a team called Cities. And so basically we work with cities across the world to really track where they're headed, make sure that their solutions make sense for the communities that we know matter to cities, and then help the company actually track where cities are headed and make sure that we're aligned with where they're going. And I think that what many of us know, especially if you're coming from the mobility space or the disability advocacy space, is that our cities are getting more complicated every day, specifically at the curb. Um, con contested space for the curb right now, it feels like all that everybody's talking about. We have new micromobility congestion. We have all kinds of pick up and drop off spaces. Um, really like a huge change in the infrastructure and logistics of that. And I really think that um, the, the way that we navigate cities has become much more complicated for all of us. I don't think it's very legible for all of us to know how to navigate cities intuitively anymore. I think that's inherently an accessibility issue that all of us are facing, and we need to start with accessible design to find solutions to that. And I think that really intersects with an issue that 
legitimately keeps me up at night all the time, which is that we have a real legibility gap just in terms of translation and comprehension and literacy. About 80% of people globally are literate, but it's only one to 3% of people with disabilities who have basic literacy skills. And in increasingly complex world, and as we globalize all of our systems, and there's so much forced migration because of conflict or environmental disaster, like if, if we as tech companies and as cities are not planning for the fact that our citizens can't understand basic information about how to use our systems and infrastructure, we're losing 30% of the people that matter um, to our homes, to our places. Um, so I think that's, those are two things that I think that are really top of mind for me. I do think that a bright spot, one that I've been thinking about, is just last year, um, the New Jersey governor actually uh, signed into law um, compelling the Department of Transportation in New Jersey to, uh, in, as a part of their complete street strategy, consider people with cognitive disabilities in terms of their design. And this is really unprecedented. About 60% of all people with disabilities have cognitive disabilities. Myself as a neurodivergent person, like it is, it is overwhelming to navigate new environments. That's something that 60% of all people with disabilities deal with every single day. And I think that as our cities become more complex, we need to really standardize design, understanding um, neurocognitive um, uh, disparities uh, in, our, in our communities as basically standard. And we need to really learn how to integrate those design features into our basic understanding of safety and legibility. Hmm. And this all sounds positive, Joey, but what's the reality of where human design-centered approaches are failing today when it comes to transportation solutions? Like, wh where are we dropping the ball even though there seems to be progress occurring you know, on the design side? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely progress. Like, I mean, I'd be lying if I said we're worse off today than we were 50 years ago. Like, we definitely have improved a lot of, you know, of, of our offerings of independence in terms of transportation to people with disabilities. Um, I mean, some of the things that, Sean, you mentioned in your opening statements and that Brianna touched on, for, you know, from a legislation standpoint, we are taking steps to retrofit, you know, public transportation sectors, whether it be, you know, subways in New York or, you know, at Chicago and LA have, you know, similar initiatives. But as you mentioned, those are incredibly costly and are looking at a 25 year or so timeline of completion because we didn't think of accessibility and inclusion from the onset. So those are problems that you know, are kind of systemic and go really across the country, city to city, that where you're gonna need to um, retrofit. But um, I think you know, being on this stage today in, is kind of indicative of how we can see true solutions. Um, cities working with companies like Uber to make sure that as their cities grow and they plan for the future that they're planning properly. I think bringing people from the disability community to those conversations is paramount. It has to happen. That way we are making sure that there are services and programs that are proper and are truly meeting the needs of the disability um, community and people that in those capacities. So I think those are definitely you know, some steps that have been taken to get us to a better future and some ideas of how we can make a better future moving forward. I mean, technology continues to innovate. There's a lot of good things happening in the tech space that makes life easier. I mean, as Uber becomes more established, there is more on-demand um, independent transportation capabilities. Um, they're not perfect, but they are definitely a positive step in the right direction, as Brianna mentioned. We have more micro transit solutions in cities that can um, offer more tailored specialized services, whether it be to people in wheelchairs or in you know, different capacities like that. But um, you know, there's a lot we can do to make sure that just the communication that Brianna mentioned is better communicated, whether it be understanding different drop off times or, or shuttle times and all those things, like getting the information is crucial. And sometimes that's where we drop the ball as a society, so. And so we're hearing both technological advancements that can play a role in improving this, but also a lot of the failures just to seem to be taking into account the various different use cases and challenges that might be experienced on a solution. How much can technology do here, Kevin? And like, how do you avoid where, Kevin, where technology is seen as a solution but is deployed to have the opposite effect? And we can talk about some of those. Like, how do you correctly use technology as a tool to make progress against some of these challenges? My favorite question. <laughs> and, you know, technology 
is incredible. It's uh, progressed us in so many ways, and as you see in the news now, even more about AI and so on. But if you really think about technology and the investments and the way that you know we as humans um, focused on, it's like a lot of screen-based use, right? You have the VR, AR systems coming out. A lot of these technology investments have been made not with, of course, inclusivity in mind, because again, financial maximum X, Y, Z. So in the way that I think the technology will be advancing in the future, and that's what we're all building here today, is to make it so that it is inclusive. And one of the elements to that is just tapping into a sense that has not been utilized for a very long time. So that's why haptic remains its footing um, in inclusivity as the major core, fa uh, core uh, functionality for all of our technology products. But at the same time, we also understand that like, you know, Sight and audio is not everything. You know, your phone has been adapting into a lot of new use cases, and one of the major component that is not very invested into has been haptic. So that's where we want to really evolve it, and I believe that's going to be, you know, what we call now a universal language through touch. And you know, Uber is such an incredible company, and you know, the way that ride sharing has become a thing in the last 10 years. Um, and it's going to evolve further into autonomous vehicles. And I think that's something that, you know, um, is, you know, we can talk about more in depth. But all in all, I personally believe, and I've been working in haptics for the last 10 years, also because my friend uh, Marcus Angle, he became blind through a pretty traumatic accident. And from this point on, he came to me and said, after a year of rehabilitation, Google Maps and Apple Maps are not accessible and this is causing a lot of stress in my life and day to day. So that's kind of like what initiated a lot of the conversations and by working with blind communities and you know, people with uh, deafness, hearing impaired, you know, uh, visual impairments from all different spectrums, we understand like what people truly want is accurate, clear communication with the, their surrounding. Disability truly is an information barrier and as soon as you overcome that, there's not really much to it. So I think what we're just trying to do is just to overcome a lot of the, the barriers between them and um, yeah, unlock new possibilities. Yeah. We've heard a lot about kind of Uber and Lyft and certainly like a decade ago in Brooklyn, if you got in a taxi and said, I'm going to Brooklyn, they kicked you out and then you tried the next cab until eventually someone agreed to take you home. And that's Brooklyn, not even stretching into East New York and some of the more challenging areas to go to from a distance perspective. That has changed a lot with Uber and Lyft allowing for a greater kind of network of cars that can service different areas. But when it comes to wheelchair accessible vehicles, you still have a supply issue way up the top of the funnel, which is almost every wheelchair accessible van on the streets today is a retrofit. They buy a Pacifica, they buy a Honda Pivot, they put say 50 grand worth of retrofit into it and end up with an incredibly expensive car, but also a low volume of these solutions. While you think there'd be a lot of drivers open to catering to that additional use case, if the supply of vehicles doesn't exist, how do you ever get down to the final experience being improved? And so I guess what role do you feel Uber can play in open up and improving accessibility and mobility to these different demographics and user types? Especially in cases when the vehicle supply, as an example, is something potentially that you can't control. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's my, that's a sad part of my job, Sean, just trying to figure that out. <laughs> Stepping into Uber and realizing that for many years, Uber had like stepped into a space of um, wheelchair accessible supply that they really didn't understand, that I think that they like really thought that they could uh, apply their model to a wheelchair accessible supply and didn't understand the historical underinvestments and barriers in wheelchair accessible vehicles. And I think this is what happens. I mean, you, you gave that example of what used to happen if you got into a taxi in Manhattan and asked to go to Brooklyn. What Rideshare really solved for is what it, I call and many of us in the disability community call a self-efficacy problem. So this is really the, self-efficacy is really the idea that like I can um, reliably recreate a scenario. I can, I can do something over and over again and predict the same outcome. And that gives me a feeling of control and autonomy in my environment, and it increases my perception of safety in our environment. So rideshare is great because it increased self-efficacy for everybody who lived in Brooklyn and wanted to leave a bar late night in Manhattan. But it did so based on 
um, what it considered a predictable set of variables. And so when we're looking at really the environment of supply, like an underinvestment for decades in something like Wave, we have to understand the many different types of variables that have limited supply in that area. There was never the appropriate federal investment. There was never a concern for really assessing true demand. There was consistent ableism that really saw us as disabled people as not wanting to be in our communities, not having any reason to be in our communities, not having really access to education and work opportunities. Um, and so those existing underinvestments we need to counter. And so one of my roles in uh, kind of the, the policy lens is really working with cities and states to understand where these gaps are. We can coordinate existing supplies. So we work with paratransit agencies all over the country. We have huge partnerships in Boston, in Denver, now with Austin, where we're actually trying to take existing supply that most people who use wheelchairs would normally have to call ahead 24 hours a week sometimes in advance and only operated nine to five. Sometimes you'd have to wait hours. Now we're bringing them online into fleets and actually operating our logistics model with existing supply, with paratransit agencies, with hospitals, sometimes with nonprofits who have access to these supply chains. But we also want to talk about where are the underinvestments that we really just need to make wheelchair accessible vehicles just more affordable to people and families who want to own and operate them. We need to standardize safety and training, standardize certificate process. It's not magic but it is a type of coordination that our cities and states and federal government have never emphasized before. And I do think that that can be the role of technology if we accept it. I really don't think that it's fair for technologists to call themselves innovators if we're simply replicating existing inequities in our environment. And so we have to be willing to step into a policy space that hasn't existed and not be excited that we can bypass regulations, but actually be willing to say, this was never right. We're not going to accept that like we just have to answer to ongoing lawsuits um, in, in a way where we get to push back against regulations that have failed the disability community for so long, we can actually uh, do something different and we can motivate a different type of policy conversation. And I do think that there's a role for tech to play in that, but it needs to be embedded in what communities of people with disabilities want and have long been asking for. It can't be sidestepping our communities. It can't be working in silos. It really needs to be about what are, the, what are the product solutions that have been designed by communities? How can we effectively work with policymakers um, to change a situation that has too, been too longstanding? Yeah. And so the movement away from, from taxis to, to ride hailing and car sharing, Joey, is like it has improved with the number of deserts of uh, mobility options that are limited, but it hasn't solved all of them. Uh, are there other solutions you see that can grow access to mobility in some of these areas that are challenged? And then the one piece that's interesting when you've moved away from the taxi experience, uh, you saw it with Waymo had a competition, we'll talk about AVs later, but Waymo had a competition of helping people who are visually impaired identify which car was theirs because lack of a human operator takes out an additional source of support. Um, as Uber and Lyft becomes a more predominant f uh, form of transportation, mm -hmm. How can we also help people identify vehicles, figure out where they should be going uh, when the kind of the identifier of a yellow cab in New York, as an example, is no longer relevant? Yeah, I mean, that, that problem right there is one that really plagues the visually impaired community every day. Um, I have never once identified my Uber based on the license plate because it's not practical and I can't do it. Uh, I can't see well enough to identify you know, the, the red Kia their license plate. I just hope that when a red car looks, you know, pulls up to my spot and I see my map on Uber, that those two, you know, align and that it's right. So, um, car identification is would be a huge benefit of, uh, and a huge example of you know technology and like a ride sharing service kind of unifying to meet a need that the community really has. Um, there's there's a confidence in knowing you're getting in the right car that eases anxiety and just makes you feel so much more secure as a rider, especially when you're disabled. Um, and, you know, you know, even if you're not disabled, there's a confidence in you know, a, a female rider knowing that she's getting in the right car when she is leaving a bar in Brooklyn at you know, one o'clock in the morning. So the ability to find those cars and have confidence is, is a practical solution to a real world problem 
that has downstream positive impacts that go just beyond the disability community into a more universally beneficial impact. Totally. Yeah, and is that, if you look at haptic technology, like, it took me 15 minutes at Austin Airport to find yeah. my car. I have okay vision, but mm -hmm. I it still struggled. Is, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, so, yeah, yeah so I, I came out of the um, same airport, and it was, I had a little bit of background knowledge, which kind of helped, and I have no problem asking for help, but there was still, I was looking for a dark red car, and from where I was standing at my, my rideshare pickup, a dark red car looked really similar to a black car or a blue car, just because of how dark the garage we were in was. And that's why it's really cool to be sitting on stage with Kevin from Haptic, because a hands-free kind of, you know, tactile form of navigation that allows me to be alert and can guide me to a destination is a, is a huge impact. And one of the most important things to me that his company has, has that he's talked about has done is thought about accessibility and inclusion from the beginning. And they, they designed and built their technology that way, and I think that is a prime example of what forward thinking can look like as we move forward in transportation, whether it be in policy, um, rideshare, transportation systems, or technology. Think accessibility, think inclusion from the beginning, and then reap the rewards downstream that come from those. Yeah, and you've, I've seen examples where people use an airport as an example or a conference like this. Mm -hmm. There's been cases where VR has been used to help people actually experience and navigate an environment before they actually arrive at that situation and have a situational awareness that's increased from where they started or if they had arrived at South By without seeing it before. Is that actually a relevant solution? Is that gimmicky and it's just VR getting another application thread? It, 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 yes and no. Um, there's 100% value in an ability to maybe put on a headset and familiarize yourself and kind of pre-orient yourself to a location that you're going to. Like if I could put a headset on and have navigated the Austin airport, I would have been a lot more confident in knowing how to get from point A to point B within that. However, it's not really practical because you still need someone to go out and create a, a VR replica of every building or every you know, massive venue. Um, that's why we hope that indoor navigation can kind of bridge that gap and then really create a more holistic, unified form of navigation. Um, that you know takes the best of maybe what Kevin's company is doing, and Uber. Like I, I dream of a world where I have a whole unified and complete form of transportation from the moment I leave my house, whether it's walking down the street, going to the store, the airport, public transpo, where I can be independent the entirety of that journey. I never need to rely on anybody else. There's integrated technology that allows me to just seamlessly go from street navigation to indoor to public transportation, like that, that'd be a dream. So I, that's where I think the real solution would be and kind of move beyond maybe the VR familiarization model. Yeah, and it seems to expose Kevin that like haptics has a range of different applications for a range of different use types, that it's not just going to be applicable to people with vision impairments. There's other challenges around moving, in, or, uh, moving through urban environments that can be solved through it. When you design this technology, I, is your passion still in it only being applied in one area, or do you see this broader use case evolving over time? The whole point of a universal language is to, I believe, be utilized by everyone. And that's, I think, the end all be all, mm. truly. And, you know, accessibility is, it should be a standard. It should be a standardized system across the board, and the normality of it should be improving at every stage of the way. But the use case of it, if it can be applied equally in the same exact manner across every human being on the planet, that's a win. That's the ultimate technology, in my opinion. And I feel like, you know, there's a lot of improvements to be done in Uber. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> yeah, but um, truly speaking, like, you know, there, there are these challenges that are not just for the blind and vision impaired, of course. and. Um, you know, as you mentioned, I've also landed in Austin. I was looking for the pickup zone and the airports, and I've you know traveled a lot. And this becomes even more difficult, as, actually, as um, I obviously go further out into underdeveloped countries, and or if I'm just like tired, right? So these are scenarios that happen more and more often. You know, I think as people become more you know uh, in tune to traveling, and as that becomes more like you know popularized, I suppose. 
Um, and I think there's multiple challenges that we're talking about, right? It's going to the actual pickup zones, finding even the gate of the airplane, and then actually finding the vehicle of what you're getting into. So these are all still based and tied to the same solution, right? That's why the universal solution really of like, let's say haptic technology, because we can all feel through our skin, right? Biggest organ in our body. This allows us to be able to, you know, experience that exact thing, smooth, intuitive way of waving your phone and feeling which direction is correct um, entirely through your fingertips is intuitive, but also accessible and available for everyone. So that's, I believe, the again, like I can't emphasize enough the passion I have for accessibility and like the, the, the people that I've worked with in the past 10 years. I was just in Ghana and also in Kenya as well, providing a lot of uh, technology from Google. And we've been partnering with them for about the past three years. And by providing Pixel phones, I bring them to these organizations, Ghana Blind Union, and um, to a couple of other organizations in the US. And we provide uh, smartphones, the newest smartphones, and the Hepic navigation technology in uh, synchronization. And so for people that have not had uh, the newest smartphones or even a smartphone in general and never have used haptic navigation technology, for them this is like uh, really a truly game changer. And so that's where truly the impact lies, that's where the passion lies. But again, to have everybody be able to, you know, use that same technology across the board in every single country around the world in the exact same way in order to improve quality of life, but at the same time, improve the entire experience and make things better and safer. That's the goal. Yeah. And as much as Kevin's throwing it on Uber to fix everything, this stuff doesn't, like $5 billion in New York City to improve the subway stations doesn't happen without significant political movements, specific and pretty large community action, corporate involvement. Mm -hmm. How do people actually drive change like that? Like, what have you seen actually work in building momentum around policy? How do people influence policy when sometimes it feels like you're just an ant on a molehill trying to make change in something that is very difficult to move? Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, we've been focused on internal to rideshare is that across teams, we have a product equity team, we have a fairness team who really thinks about how to bridge lived experience design with the needs of our company. And of course, it's all about, for in the tech company, you know, we talk about um, uh, growth drivers. We have to really convince our executives of what is a growth driver for our company. And so for us, it's really about assessing the opportunity. So what are the current barriers for our users? What's the growth outset there? And so in between, I think, user-focused design and then really focusing on what we offer, we've been able to make some really big movements. So even something as simple as being able now to walk into at any CVS and trade in cash for Uber credits, that was really generated through community-based design for a lot of people who are unbanked. And we're finding these solutions all throughout the world. Um, the ability to select your gender identity as a, as a driver um, in the app now, that was generated through um, user-facing design. Um, so was an entire, uh, what we call our Uber for Business team. We contract with thousands of healthcare organizations all across the country to provide back-end logistics management of transportation to and from non-emergency medical transportations relying on Medicaid and Medicare benefits. This is really solving for one of the biggest things. The biggest barrier to healthcare is transportation. And so by improving the opportunity for on-demand transportation and just making it more efficient for care managers, making it more efficient for the user, that's a way to really solve for this. Um, you know, I come from like the housing equity space, the justice space. I can't convince Uber to solve housing inequality. However, we can work with cities to emphasize, for example, um, uh, fewer uh, parking lots, for example, making sure that our cities themselves are more mobile, more accessible overall, less private car dependent. Um, I know that people have a hard time believing that one of Uber's biggest strategies uh, uh, in a sustainability campaign is actually reducing private car ownership. In Australia last year, we incentivized dozens of families to give up their private cars, of course for the company, with the, the bet that it would probably lead to increased rideshare usage. 
But that was um, really the smallest um, way that families shifted their mobility use in this study. They most often opt opted for public transportation, walking, and cycling, which is something that we need. We need a mixed modality future. We need to recognize the vitality of public transportation as the best and most sustainable option, and then fill in the gaps. And I also think that, like, we're so centered, of course, on the global north and our technology sphere. Uh, Kevin was just talking about Ghana and Nairobi. We met at a conference in um, Nairobi last year. And as a non-technology person, it was the first time ever that I've been excited by a tech expo space because I walked in and there were all of these disabled folks who had created solutions to the gaps they faced every day and they were pitching them to Microsoft and Google and to myself at Uber. And I think that that we need to acknowledge that the future of innovation is really not here in the US. We need to be working with communities of people with disabilities globally, investing in their technology solutions, and then actually be willing to integrate them into platforms like Uber. Hmm. And it's a good, that's a good segue. It was here in 2012 where Steve Mann, the director of the Santa Clara Institute for the Blind, took the first ride in an L4 autonomous vehicle ever on the planet. Uh, he did a six and a half mile drive from his hotel to a local medical appointment here uh, with a Google self-driving car. This morning, Tigidra Marokana, the CEO of uh, Waymo, announced that Austin is their next market that they're going to be launching in the next couple of weeks. Self-driving cars have been flagged or tagged as the, the source of mobility at a dollar per mile or less. I got my Uber to the airport. It was $7.10 a mile. And they're claiming this transportation solution will be available for a dollar per mile from a cost perspective. Is AV a silver bullet? But at the same time, you now remove a human occupant who's there to help people, guide people. What positive and negatives are we going to see from the AV evolution as it spreads to more cities? We're now Phoenix, San Francisco, Austin, and LA are all going to have ride hailing services at L4 levels. I'd love to hear all of your opinions on whether this is a big positive step forward in mobility accessibility or whether it's going to unlock a range of other challenges that haven't yet to be tackled. I'll start and say both and all. Um, you know, the promise of autonomy is something that people with disabilities have been waiting for for a long time. We've been co-designing. You know, a lot of companies really have embedded lived experience design in their solutions and also we have been heavily leveraged by these companies to make room in city infrastructure for their designs while we haven't been fully incorporated, right? Part of that is affordability. Not only who has access to take some of these, um, these first rides in, uh, in autonomous vehicles to really give feedback, emphasize the safety priorities for disabled folks, the communications priorities when things do go wrong, but just the affordability of autonomy in general. If we're, if we're creating another piece of logistics infrastructure that's so far out of reach for vulnerable community members who lack access to economic security, we're just replicating the issue. We also haven't solved two of the biggest issues in rideshare and autonomous mobility in general, which is locating the vehicle with this increasing congested curb space. How are we gonna design an elegant solution for that to let people be truly independent? and universal securement of wheelchairs so that a person can truly get into a car with whatever mobility that they have, with whatever hand mobility they have, and be able to secure a personal wheelchair in a vehicle without assistance. And so until I think we solve those two major issues, we're not actually fulfilling the promise that autonomy offers. Yeah. Yeah. And Joey, how do you react to it personally and certainly from a professional perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be kind of repeating a lot of what Brianna said. It's, it's a yes and no, good and bad type thing. Um, you know, the visually impaired community, we, we do want autonomous vehicles because it's gonna open up doors to more independent um, forms of travel. The biggest thing it's gonna do is it's gonna remove the human variable in terms of, of prejudice, where it might be, um, you, know, neg you know, a rider not wanting to take somebody with a service animal, autonomous vehicles will remove that barrier. Um, so if we get AVs right and they're retrofitted to be wheelchair accessible, that we can, we can find them and identify them safely and securely. If we can you know, check those boxes and truly solve those issues, then the AV market is gonna be one of the most transformative, impactful 
um, innovations in transportation that you know the BVI community has ever experienced, but you know probably the disability community at large. However, you know Brianna did bring up like those are those are big ifs, right? And you know making sure that we continue to talk with the members of those communities as AVs become more ubiquitous, making sure that the needs of those communities are being met and met you know, specifically towards their needs. It's, it, we don't want accessibility for accessibility's sake. We want truly impactful need meeting accessibility. So if those conversations continue to happen and those innovations are made in that capacity, I think AVs will be one of the most you know, transformative things to happen in transportation for people like me. Yeah, I mean, if you look at today, they're talking, you know, most AVs on the road are retrofits of existing vehicles, mm -hmm. uh, both with redundant power steering and braking. You know, so you turn your own off. No worries. Better? There you go. There you go. Um, I was trying to be loud, hopefully. Yeah, if you look at the vehicles on the road today, you have I-Pace, you have Pacificas. They're all there because they have redundant power steering and braking, and they're essentially retrofitting existing cars. The next version and evolution of that is going to be purpose-designed autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. And so then the question becomes, how do the right perspectives and voices play a role in the design of the next models of cars? Yeah. Uh, especially with EVs, you're going to have both front and rear trunk space. You're going to not need a forward-facing vehicle, or even a windshield. You can now repurpose the cabin. How do you make sure the right voices are at the table as those type of things occur and develop? and that the right partnerships are created to ensure we're not spending five billion fixing them yeah. for in 2055? Well, I, I, honestly, I think a platform like this is, is a good first step. I mean, we have, I mean, Sean, you formerly worked at Waymo. Kevin, it works in tech innovation, and Brianna gets to work at Rideshare, like Uber, and I get to represent a community that I'm a part of and take great honor in, in having that ability to do. Those, these are great conversations to make sure that all those voices are being heard. Um, I, I, I think the only way we're gonna solve these truly complex issues that we've talked about today is if we, you, it's gonna be a collaborative, cooperative, and you know, partnership-driven model. We need city planners to think proactively and be at the table. We need you know, tech, tech companies like Kevin and rideshare and transportation systems like Uber and you know, microtransit solutions, public transportation solutions, all at the table. However, we also need multiple representatives from the disability community. Like they have to be at the table, you know, pushing the innovation in a, in a very specific way. Because if we don't, we're gonna look at down the road 15 or 20 years from now and need to spend another $5 billion to fix problems that we ignore today, just like we're just like you know New York City is doing currently to try and retrofit problems that they ignored 25, 50, 75 years ago. Hmm. And you've seen such significant like Build Back Better funding for EVs, for chargers, for all of these different technology movements. How do you build the same lobbying power when it comes to accessibility? And I don't know if you've seen that in your career, Brianna, of like strong strategies at work to unlock those federal funding dollars that today are being pointed at so many different initiatives, but don't seem to be as much focused on accessibility, unless I'm wrong, I'd love to be corrected. No, I don't think so. I think that one of the things that we've done in our advocacy communities is we've replicated silos that exist in our governance structure because of budget scarcity. And so we stay in our silos because we know exactly who to talk to about which specific issues. And I think that Certainly, we, we have made advancements and are in disability advocacy specific to community needs, but at this point, we're heavily siloed in a way that just doesn't really represent, it doesn't, um, yeah, it doesn't mirror the way that all of us experience our lives, which are heavily intersectional. And I think that the things that we deal with in the disability community are the same things that racial equity communities and gender and sexuality equity communities have been working towards, um, you know, housing justice, decarceration. I think that, yeah, as I already mentioned, people impacted by conflict, um, be that you know, geopolitical conflict or in our own communities or people really dealing with um, the impacts of climate change, that there's, there's really no, re like the sustainability, the arguments for sustainable communities is, is also the arguments for community integration for people with disabilities. We need to be working together and kind of ignore the budget silos that exist in our governance structures and creating much more complex and inter intersectional solutions. So I think that like when we talk about accessibility, I don't think that we can really talk just about 
disability access. We're talking about what does independence look like overall? How does uh, you know, a person with multiple vulnerabilities, multiple intersections navigate their communities? And how can we create one, a cohesive solution rather than piecemeal solutions um, for which there's really no framework or necessity for a company or a community to take on? Yeah. And if you look to the airline industry, like some of the biggest accomplishments they made in safety were by teaming up across airlines, sharing data, sharing technology, sharing insights. Kevin, like you talked about Google and a couple other partnerships. We've got Uber here. Are there examples where partnerships are being formed across community, corporate, technology lines to bring this initiative forward? And if no, is that what's needed? Is more valuable partnerships in the ecosystem? I don't know if you had examples of that. Yeah, um, short answer is, we need to partner with as many partners as possible. And enterprise, they have all the power. So in the, the ways that we you know, understand Google, Apple, and you know, et cetera, there's really two major map apps that we use, right? Google Maps and Apple Maps. And really even amongst those two, there's always a monopoly winner like Google Maps. Um, but before I kind of get into that, I wanted to take a step back and talk about the autonomous vehicle because I, I had a very, uh, you know, I have very deep thoughts about this, and for those of you that don't know, Sean used to be the chief business officer at Waymo. So with that, you know, we've dove a lot into what the future of autonomous vehicle will bring, and it will happen, same thing as AI, and it's um, just a preparation game. So Waymo actually did um, have a foot in accessible uh, ways that blind, specifically blind and visually impaired users will be able to find vehicles, because again, you won't be able to call a driver once after there's nobody in the wheel. So how do you do that? And their solution was based on kind of the old method of audio, right? So they were creating a custom honking noise in order to identify that a vehicle has arrived, which is again, not the best solution, right? You can imagine loud environments, Times Square, early mornings, where you're not gonna want to have that as, a, as the actual only solution. So uh, we are, we have discussed haptic navigation to autonomous vehicles, which would solve all of, a lot of that issue being one of the potential um, enterprise partnerships that we would love to uh, you know, keep pursuing. So autonomous vehicles, of course, you know, Uber is gonna be part of it. Uh, all the ride sharing businesses will be part of it. And I think that's you know, uh, a really great start for us. We know that this is a pretty new industry. It's become quite profitable and it's become a, you know, a very impactful app and use for all of us, right? I think you may use it more than most of the apps now on your phone. So with that in mind, let's make it inclusive, right? Let's make it accessible. What are the solution bases? What's out there? We've been doing this for 10 years, a bit uh, premature maybe, but I, th I don't think so. I think we were taking it very seriously at a very early standpoint because we believe in the mission and now the big companies are going to have to take a, a, an approach and a stance because one thing that I've learned from talking with Meta just the other day, uh, there's gonna be a new regulation happening quite soon. I know you've been hearing that for a long time, but officially the European Accessibility Act will be coming through June of next year, 2025, and that will be the first step forward where other countries like the US will follow suit. So that's a great sign for us. It will become uh, a necessity, a standard that will improve and we will be right there in order to make it happen with the companies and provide uh, a very easy plug-in solution, not, hey, develop all of this from scratch, spend three years developing you know, R&D, and then try it out and see how it works, and then try again. It's gonna be, hey guys, we've been doing this for a long time, we've made history, we've already built out haptic languages that have worked with, you know, across the board of every single country in the world, and now it's time for you to you know, take the approach right with us. So. With, with what we were talking about before also with airports, these are challenges that, you know, I, I was in the first airplane I think Joey took uh, outside of Florida coming to New York. And that was, uh, that was really interesting because I, you know, we all struggle with finding things indoors in new spaces. South by Southwest is not uh, an excuse, right? You're going to exhibitions, you're going to halls, you're finding friends. It's just like, it's a stressor, honestly. And I think if you're blind and vision impaired, it can be very, very challenging. So, you know, we're just trying to unlock these zones, make sure that this will not be a stressor of the future. It would actually be an enjoyable, intuitive experience. Let's say you go to Disneyland, and instead of having to find all these rides, you get to feel your way to these areas, and it becomes kind of this magical experience. 
And I think that should be the way technology is used in the future. That is the accessibility standard that should exist in the world. And yeah, so if you are part of this movement as a policymaker, as a decision maker, as an influencer, whatever it could be, uh, you're part of the movement right now, and this is all going to be happening very rapidly in the next couple of years. So please join us in this uh, journey and talk to us after. Sounds great. Um, I'm just the last question because I want to keep time for questions from the audience if there are any. But Brianna, bring us back to the optimistic. We've talked about a lot of the challenges, a lot of the roadblocks, a lot of the funding issues and politics. What keeps you optimistic? What have you seen that is encouraging about what's coming in 2024 and beyond when it comes to mobility? Uh, and how can everybody here play a role in, in helping push these things forward? I think that the conversation specifically in the last few years around equity in general has really highlighted one of, I think, the biggest barriers in ableism that I've really seen examples of how we can push past because I think we've done it in other conversations, not perfectly, in terms of <laughs> racial equity and gender and sexuality equity, and that is shame. And I really think that for those of us who work in governance and in tech, even for those of us who are disabled but don't necessarily know enough about accessibility, don't know enough about the next strategy, I really think that the thing that keeps us all from feeling like we can step into the space is the belief that we should know differently and that we should be able to find the solution. Um, and undoing this sense of perfectionism and really this shame that we have, I think it takes the acknowledgement that like, we're not expected to be experts in everything and that there are solutions and that we can work across communities. And I think that especially in the past year and a half at Uber, there's just been so many bright spots, specifically in my work with communities of service animal users in really finding solutions to the long-standing issues of people experiencing discrimination in rideshare to the point where it is now, I just wanna pick up on one thing that Kevin said, where like mobility has become a lot more joyful for the people that I've been working with in those communities because there's a sense that there's willingness to, move, to learn, to co-design, to try different things and fail, and to move past really this sense of shame that I think a lot of us as technologists have, that we don't know the solution. We know there's a problem, but we can't admit that there's a problem because we don't know the solution. And so I do think that equity in general has moved to this place in this conversation where we're realizing that if we just remove that initial barrier and just say, I don't know, I want to know, let's figure it out together, I do see more and more people willing to have that conversation. And that includes think, with policymakers. Policymakers and their um, willingness to work with Rideshare, for example, they're coming to us now and saying, we recognize we can't do this alone. Our community members rely on you. Let's figure this out together. So I do think that there's a lot more sense of collaboration in the environment as a whole. And I'm trying to let that be, <laughs> <laughs> offer positive momentum for the future. Yeah. Do you share the optimism, Joey? Why do you think tomorrow is going to be better than today? I mean, I, I definitely do. I mean, I just look back. You, you, you challenge the audience to kind of think about all the steps and forms of transportation they had to use to get here today. And I, I, I've been thinking about that while on stage. And, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I'm not sure I ever would have had the confidence to fly alone, travel alone, and just, you know, come to a new place that I have no idea what's going on by myself with a visual impairment. But, you know, you have technology that helps, you do it a few times and you build some confidence and you talk to people that could, you know, maybe give you a little bit of insight into what, you know, the Austin airport might be like. You reach out and get, you know, additional services and programs and you get this newfound confidence and independence to be able to do things. So I think that that's kind of indicative of what the future can really be like. Um, I mentioned it earlier, but I, I really do feel like we're on the cusp of, technology transforming what it means to have independent and autonomous um, mobility. Um, it, it, we have to do a lot of things right to get there, but I, I do think we're not that far from a day where a person can leave their house and go do whatever they want to do. They want to go shop or walk the streets. They don't have to worry about you know, inaccessible sidewalks. I feel like we're, we're moving towards those types of solutions where, you know, public transportation is more accessible. Ride sharing is a, is a more improved solution and offering more independence. Companies like Haptic are providing solutions for, you know, safer and more confident forms of navigation. I feel like we're really close to putting the pieces together 
if we just continue to collaborate and cooperate and partner together to meet those needs. I mean, we've talked about a lot of complex issues today and none of them are gonna be solved by any one entity on the stage or any one entity at all. Um, a go like government approaching Uber, sh or show us that government can't do it on their own. It, they need industry, but industry also needs to rely on you know, the nonprofit disability sector to say, hey, you, you guys are experts. You do have insights that we can you know, ensure are put into the solution. So I think we're close, but I think there's you know, vital steps that need to be taken towards a brighter future, but I, I am very optimistic. Yeah, I'm not sure anything's a better uh, takeaway than the compassion necessary that people would have heard about coming to South By and one of their biggest fears would have been navigating the airport and think how, how minimal that is for most people, that the last thing you think about is how am I going to get through the airport and certainly wouldn't go into it with concerns, yet that is a decent percentage of the population who that's their immediate reaction to travel, which is... Yeah, something to keep in yeah, mind. I mean, absolutely. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I would, I would say just in closing, like, absolutely. I mean, like, there's, there's, there's kind of a baseline anxiety traveling to a new place for anybody, let alone whether or not you have a disability. I mean, and then when you think about having a disability and the added anxiety that comes with trying to have that sense of independence, I mean, you know, 20% of our population has a disability and, you know, 53% suffer or are directly impacted by either a family member or a caregiver who have a disability. So, like, it's a great portion of the population that suffers from these types of impacts, so. Yeah. Kevin, any final thoughts before we open up to questions? Yeah, I would love to announce this uh, for the first time also live, that we have partnered officially with Mapbox. And for, again, um, you know, it's not Google. Um, we've been already working with Google for about three years again, and you know, they've been amazingly helpful in testing our technology with their ERG team but also uh, providing us with technology to implement, integrate our haptics properly to their hardware. But in terms of also navigating South by Southwest, they've also been a partner of us uh, for about you know, three years as well. And next year, we are aiming to do all of South by's navigation utilizing haptic navigation, which will make it fully inclusive, accessible, and everything that, that, you know, that we want. So I'm very excited for that to be happening next year. Um, and furthermore, we do want to be expanding out and creating the pipelines so that we don't have to, you know, push this thing so hard with, you know, the communities that, of course, want and need this, but with the, the communities that are still not understanding haptic technology, right? There's, there's a, a lot of big gaps here between, you know, catching on to AI and, like, really trending topics and something that's really impactful and important that will you know, kind of slowly build into our communities and into our day-to-day -day lives. So we are just, again, so used to our maps, our, our visual sense of understanding this kind of information, and to alter and change that takes a little bit of adaption. And so, you know, I would say, please help us with the adaption process. It's all about word of mouth and feeling to believe it, right? Haptic, again, is not something you can just, you know, uh, talk about in, in five seconds, I can say information through touch, navigation, through vibrations, but what that actually feels like, you should feel it for yourself. So please give it a try and get around South by Southwest and um, yeah, and feel your way. Amazing. Um, I have a mic, I can walk around if there's anyone who has any questions. We have a few minutes left. Yeah. Oh, we go. go for it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Alan Hale uh, with Spark Access. Um, I just want to thank the panel first of all. Of uh, this is probably one of the most authentic and truly like nuanced discussions on accessible mobility. So I really appreciate that. Um, I think you touched on it in a lot of ways. Of uh, we need people with disabilities at the table for anything to really go through. Um, I'm formerly a uh, Ford Motor Company and General Motors for about 15 years. Uh, so I've been in the thick of it as well. Um, how do we go about making sure that it's not a by us with them, but a by us for us, where that pe the experience of people with disabilities is coming from the Ubers, from the Lyfts, from the Waymos, uh, and it's not this trivialized thing from the outside that requires partnerships, but you're having the internal talent. Uh, and I say that uh, as a person with a disability who uh, also helped a lot of other people and uh, the mobility industry, can really chew people with disabilities up and spit them out in different ways. Uh, so I'll leave it there. I think Brianna's gonna tackle that, but before, can you help us with any light into the challenges around supply of wheelchair accessible vehicles from working at an OEM? What is the challenge? 
talk writer? Okay, okay, fair enough. Brad, I yeah, working on affirmative hiring has definitely been a major component of my work. It's not even supposed to be, but I was like very disgruntled by my hiring experience <laughs> and so immediately started that conversation. And more and more, especially as the company knows, like there will just be an issue of translation or oh, we heard this community feedback, oh, give it to the product equity team, which is a 25 person team with lived experience. That is not how this should work. We need to be doing affirmative hiring in our delivery business and our freight business and our communications and operations perspective because they all come to us for the solutions rather than really understanding it themselves. And then they want which community has access, which organization can I call to sign off on this commercial? Um, you know, who's going to help us brand this? How can we develop these assets? And I'm like, we can do this by actually becoming an organization where we only have 1% of our internal staff identifying as people with disabilities, right? So that means that I'd imagine that 10% of us are scared and don't want to, that that is for good reason. It's never for the wrong reason. And we're not doing affirmative hiring in our roles. We're not embedding it internal. And I, I don't, I think that there's a huge lapse in understanding of what that would look like. It's a big challenge. I think we'll take one last question and I think we're gonna get kicked out. Thank you, thank you very much. I have more of a statement. First off, I wanna echo this is been a fantastic panel. I want us to also think about improving accessibility, not simply, and I'm gonna use air quotes here, helping the handicapped, but that it unleashes our ability to help society in general. It's so often just only talked about, oh, we'll enable them to go to the doctor or to the park. But there's unleashing our potential is part of what you're all talking about. And I don't like equating something being good because of money or anything, but the economic implications of more people with disabilities being able to travel, um, it, it's a big driver. People don't underestimate the huge amount of money and discretionary spending that is within mine and y'all's uh, communities. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. All right, all right. Yep. Um, would love to just understand, I'm fortunate enough to uh, have been studying in haptics, but Kevin, what do you mean um, in terms of future adoption of a universal language? What does that mean with something like Uber or Waymo? Um, you know, do they have to go through haptic nav in your internal company, or, or what does that mean in terms of actually adopting it for you know, universally across the world? that's important, and, and how do you actually think about that adoption curve? Thank you. Yeah, that's actually a great question, and I, I did want to start off with a really, the, kind of the highest level um, of the conversation, right? Universal language is pretty much as, as big as you can get, right? But if you really think about communication technology in general, or the things in our pockets, phones, the tap that you get, the vibration that you get from your smartphone, it is literally practically the same across every single device in the world. If you have a Pixel phone, if you have an Android phone, if you have an iPhone, it doesn't matter. That vibration sequence that you get to tap you and notify you, it is code number one. That is the zeros and ones of creating a language that will become in the future a lot more advanced, refined, and inclusive. So that could be the way that you can kind of paint the picture in your imagination of what universal language could be and where kind of it starts for us right now today. And the in between that navigation is one of them, right? It's a tool that must be inclusive across the board of every single human beings on the planet because it's a, again, a tool. And so the more reservoir that we have of this universal vocabs that usually will become a language it's not as you can imagine what we're doing today, which is communicating through vocals, it will be slightly different. It will be a different version of the language through touch, and that is what we're unlocking, and that is what we're trying to build. So, in short, we are at stage practically one of haptic language creation, and whatever we build from here on out will be with the partnerships with big enterprises, and with Uber, for example, the main thing that hits the mark here is you get to now find your vehicle and get to the pickup zones entirely through touch, probably a lot faster 
than looking at your phone and trying to find it yourself through vision. So that's, again, A to B to Z, but that's, that's the concept. Amazing. Please join me in thanking our panelists today, and thank you for joining for the discussion.